CPTSD and how it manifests itself as different in men and women. So for starters, you have to understand what CPTSD is. And so since we do have many uh, new ones who are joining us, uh, CPTSD is a psychiatric condition. Uh, it's a mental health condition that can develop for those who have experienced traumatic events over an extended period of time or repeatedly, such as childhood abuse, domestic violence, being a prisoner of war, or prolonged captivity. So again, CPTSD is a mental health condition that can develop uh, in people who have experienced traumatic events over an extended period of time. So you have PTSD, which is, excuse me, post-traumatic stress disorder. So C, PTSD adds on the complex, C for complex post-traumatic stress disorder, because it's not one simple traumatic event, it is many complex events. So symptoms of CPTSD include, but are certainly not limited to, intense and persistent emotional distress, difficulty controlling emotions, detachment from others, detachment from oneself, difficulty uh, trusting others, having a distorted perception of the self and others. And CPTSD can impact a person's relationships uh, where they're manifesting themselves as people pleasers, uh, and fawning in their work. It, it affects their ability to function in their daily life. And it's important for those who are experiencing complex post-traumatic stress disorder uh, to seek out assistance from a trauma specialist. So CPTSD can manifest itself differently in men versus women, uh, but the differences are acute. From my experience working with trauma survivors, I find that working both with men and women both tend to be struggling with the same things, uh, as we mentioned, the anxiety, the depression, the low self-worth, the low self-esteem, um, uh, struggling with a sense of a power, personal power, uh, personal authority, um, having difficulty managing emotions. But there are some potential differences in the way that might manifest. And the differences might not necessarily be just because they're biologically different, uh, but men and women have social expectations that are different on them, gender norms that are different, and coping mechanisms that may be different. And as a result, it may appear to manifest itself differently in men and women. However, it's important to recognize uh, that uh, complex trauma affects individuals uh, of any gender in unique ways. So the way you are affected by your trauma and um, and the maladaptations that you've developed will be different somewhat than the person standing next to you, whether they are the same gender or a different gender. Uh, but there's there's maybe some acute differences. Uh, please note, again, there is no classic demarcation, per se, between a man who's experiencing complex trauma and a woman. Uh, but men may be more likely um, to experience trauma related to combat and violence, which can result in hyperarousal symptoms such as anger, irritability, and aggression. So a lot of times when clients are coming to me, it's more often that men are coming or their wives are sending them for their anger issues or their mothers are sending young men uh, to me for anger issues. So sometimes it'll manifest itself more often uh, in um, a lack of ability to control one's anger. Um, men may also show uh, increased aggression or be less likely to seek help for their symptoms. Uh, and this again would be due to cultural expectations and ideas of masculinity and the cultural discouragement of vulnerability in men. 
Uh, so many men are in relationships where they have spouses that are narcissistic or abusive. Um, but because there's not a lot of understanding and support for a man being abused by a woman, uh, many of these men don't come forward. They don't seek help. If they do seek help, many of them have experienced that they don't get support or they may even get made fun of or laughed at or torn down for the idea that uh, they could be abused by a woman. And so as a result, um, we know of less men that are experiencing the symptoms and having and going through this abuse, not because there really necessarily are less men that are going through it, uh, but society and certain cultural norms tend to discourage uh, them seeking help. They may struggle with uh, forming relationships and maintaining healthy relationships. Uh, this is true for women as well, but it's different uh, for men slightly. Uh, with men, uh, they're more likely to become withdrawn and not speak about their emotions um, and to use maladaptive coping mechanisms such as substance abuse and engage in risk-taking behavior. Uh, to avoid difficult emotions. Uh, so that's what we, we would tend to see in men with CPTSD. Um, on the other hand, uh, with women, we may be more likely to see them coming forward and reporting their experience, um, but they're internalizing emotions. So they're afraid to show feelings uh, outwardly. Sometimes they're stuffing anger because due to some cultural norms, they may not feel comfortable uh, coming out and showing that they're angry. Um, sometimes they are feeling uh, shame, guilt, helplessness, and they're reporting this in higher numbers. Uh, women may struggle with low self-esteem and have difficulty setting boundaries in relationships. So when it comes to the relationship issues that women tend to run into, uh, they tend to be abused more often, but they also tend to set uh, have difficulty setting boundaries more often. As a result, they tend to develop um, avoidant attachment due to their lack of trust. And uh, that lack of trust exacerbates itself in them seeking out emotionally uh, unavailable partners sometimes, uh, which can be persons who live far away, persons who are in prison, persons who are already in a marriage, or who are just emotionally available in, in other forms. And in other ways, they may just not seek out relationships at all. They may become withdrawn due to their bad experiences and their lack of trust for others. Or they develop an anxious avoidant attachment. And the anxious attachment means that half the time they are avoiding people but then they become so desperate for uh, connection and they feel so lonely uh, that they um, look for a way to fill the void. And in their desperation, they end up in another uh, toxic or abusive, um, not healthy relationship situation. So we see this often with women. Again, this can happen both with men and women, uh, but we, we're seeing it more often. Uh, and it's being reported by, by women. Women are also more likely to experience dissociative symptoms, uh, such as feeling detached from their bodies or experiencing prolonged amnesia. Uh, so dissociation is very big with women. Uh, women also experience emotional numbing. Uh, and studies suggest that women are more likely than men to experience interpersonal trauma, such as emotional, physical, and sexual abuse, which are already common causes of CPTSD. Women may also be more likely to develop, um, well, I already mentioned that, dissociative symptoms. Um, so in terms of dissociation, that can take on many forms and it's different for everyone. Um, so when you're working with your, uh, tr your trauma specialist, you should mention that you're feeling dissociated. Um, and how severe it is, because it can manifest itself as acute as ADHD or as severe as uh, not remembering where you've been for the past day or so. 
So again, we got to remember these are generalizations. Everyone's experience with CPTSD is different. So regardless of gender, you seek support from who? From your trauma specialists, uh, from mental health care professionals, especially when they have a program uh, where they're seeing results and helping people to heal from CPTSD. And that's the sort of results that uh, we are seeing and, and the coaches who are trained by me are seeing. So let's touch on narcissism here for a moment. Now, for those who don't know, narcissism is a personality trait that's characterized by an inflated sense of self, grandiosity, self-importance, uh, self-admiration, and a lack of empathy for others. Uh, now, it's not always obvious that a person is a narcissist because they're not always right out there with, I feel like I'm more important than others or that I lack empathy for others. Uh, so sometimes they can be overt and sometimes they can be covert narcissists, meaning that they know how to appear on the outside to be a nice person and to be a caring person. Uh, but only when you're in an intimate relationship with them, do you notice a pattern of them lacking empathy for those who are close to them. So not everyone who manifests narcissism uh, is diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder or would qualify to be. Uh, we've, we've started to use narcissism as a colloquial term uh, for all of these egocentric persons uh, who are so extreme in their self-importance and lack of concern for others that they are actually hurting consistently the people that they're in a relationship with as a pattern. And they're doing so without regard. So they don't feel sorry for the fact that they're hurting people. And that's uh, the mark of what we're calling narcissists. I include in the description of narcissists, uh, psychopaths and sociopaths, which just means that uh, they're so extreme in what they're doing uh, that they're basically breaking the law. Um, psychopaths are covert in their uh, extreme ways of hurting others. And sociopaths are overt. They're right out there with their extreme ways of hurting other people. So that's a little snapshot of narcissism. Studies have found that men are more likely than women to exhibit grandiose narcissism, uh, which is characterized by a sense of entitlement, dominance, uh, exhibitionism, and then they tend to seek leadership positions. Uh, they engage in risk-taking behaviors, uh, display aggression, and they go on to become CEOs and chiefs and heads of companies <laughs> because they can step on everyone with their psychopathic or sociopathic behaviors. Um, they like to get into positions of political power. Um, of course, not all CEOs and uh, politicians are narcissists, uh, but narcissists are attracted to these positions that would solidify the idea that they are elite uh, or special above others. Um, and so if they have some gifts, some talents, some abilities, uh, they'll use that to their advantage uh, to gain that upper hand on, on other people. In my experience, um, I see more differences between male and female narcissists than I do in male and female uh, um, trauma survivors who have CPTSD the, or empaths. So I don't see a big difference in male and female empaths. But I see a bigger difference in male and female narcissists. Uh, so with women, they're more likely to exhibit either covert narcissism or what's called vulnerable narcissism. Uh, which is where they're showing feelings of insecurity, self-doubt, hypersensitivity, and criticism. Um, so they try to garner support and sympathy from others, uh, but they're constantly complaining. Um, but it, it's done so subtly that you don't realize that that's what's happening until you've already known them for maybe years. And then you go, you know, this person's never actually happy. And no matter what we do for them, they're never actually happy. And so, and so that we see more commonly in the way women will manifest other narcissism. So they're more likely to engage in passive aggressive behavior and be manipulative. Um, both males and females are manipulative as narcissists, 
and they utilize triangulation and smearing to try to control the social dynamic um, so that they can control you or their target. And so they figure that you're going to be susceptible to the to the viewpoints and the opinions of others. And so they want to control you by turning people's opinions against you and for them. So they are constantly viewing your relationship with them like a competition. And so they figure, hey, if I can get everyone here to be against this person, then I can control the dynamic. And so many female, female narcissists are experts at this. What I've observed is that narcissists tend to be uh, sexist. And so they're more likely to treat females as being worthless, as easier targets, uh, or worth less than their, their male siblings. And so I see that the abuse that narcissistic mothers put on their daughters and narcissistic fathers as well tends to be especially harsh. Uh, but especially with mothers to their daughters, because those narcissistic mothers are actually viewing the daughter as some sort of competition, as some sort of threat, as wild as that sounds. Uh, they feel the need to squash out uh, their daughter's sense of self um, and sense of um, autonomy and ability to think for themselves or believe in themselves and self-worth. So so they work at it systematically stomping this out in their daughters, which is extremely sad and difficult to watch. And so uh, daughters of narcissistic uh, mothers are having to fight to um, just maintain some sense of self. And so if you grew up in a, in a situation like this, you may have had to fawn. Um, and go with the system and the flow of your narcissistic parents um, to survive. You may have had to act like you agreed with uh, some of the behaviors and even try to agree with some of the behaviors, participate in making fun of the scapegoats in the family. Uh, you may have acted in a way that was sexist yourself or that was racist or uh, bigoted. Um, but please, understand now that you're out of that system and you had to do certain things to survive while you were under that reign and in that system, please recognize now is the time for healing and self-forgiveness for those times. We don't have to be ashamed that we developed maladaptations. Maladaptations were the ways that we coped. And so we learned not to trust, which is a maladaptation, because in that environment, we couldn't trust. We learned not to ever feel safe, which is a maladaptation because in that environment, we couldn't ever feel safe. We learned not to believe in ourselves because in that environment, it was dangerous to believe in yourself. Um, so, so understand, we learned to think of ourselves as helpless, as powerless, to identify as victims because in that environment, that's what it was. So understand there's a reason for the maladaptations. It's not a, a reason to be ashamed of yourself now, uh, but now you must recognize this is the time for self-forgiveness and healing. Now we grow. We're gaining the knowledge to understand how this manifests itself, and now we grow. Right across the board, narcissists do not accept the idea that they could be wrong. Um, and so only if their back is absolutely against the wall, will you get any type of apology or acknowledgement of anything. And so they will outright, uh, not apologize, or they will use various tactics to avoid taking responsibility, such as buying you something. If they did something wrong to you, instead of just apologizing, uh, again, they might give you a gift, but there's no apology or acknowledgement that they did anything. Or they'll just come back and try to bring up something that uh, is interesting to talk about that you might like. They try to appeal to your interests. Hey, you want to go do the such and such or the so and so, something that they think you're going to be into. Um, suddenly, uh, a, a narcissistic wife uh, may go to her husband and suddenly start showing interest in sex, whereas normally she would never show any interest. Um, or a husband will suddenly start trying to show some type of emotional um a connection when normally he is emotionally disconnected 
and, and the list can go on, but they don't apologize because narcissists do not want to be held accountable. They cannot handle the idea um, that they would be known or viewed as culpable, responsible for the bad things that they've done. So in order to be able to shut off their mind and heart to the pain that they're creating around them, they've also had to shut off their mind and the heart to their moral responsibility to not hurt and harm others. So they have to believe that it's just not happening. And so that's the story that they've created for themselves. And they cannot accept any story other than that. So no matter how hard you try to reason with this narcissistic abuser and try to get, get them to understand the point, it will not help. Do not engage. Do not engage. Do not engage. When you realize that someone is a narcissist, you should never tell them. You should simply take your step back. You can observe, but protect your energy. And in the meantime, protect your resources, your time, your money, your body, your beauty, your talents, your personal space, your possessions, your material goods, your children, your animals, protect your resources. Those belong to you. You have the authority over those things. So whether you're dealing with a male or, or a female narcissist, uh, please recognize uh, they are not anyone to continue to be engaged with until they heal. Now, can narcissists heal? I believe that narcissists can heal. Uh, will they heal? No, they will not heal. The studies have shown, the statistics are in, they don't get better. And the reason is because they don't try to get better. That is it. Is it possible for one in a million? Yes, it, the, it's possible for a human to get better. It's possible for them to get better. But please don't cherry pick what I'm saying and say, oh, Roman said it's possible. So I'm going to stay in this relationship and continue to allow my mental health to deplete, my financial health to deplete, my physical health to deplete, uh, you will have nothing left if you stick around in a relationship with a narcissist. You have nothing left. So, so what you need to do is you need to protect your resources and disconnect from the narcissist. Although you may love them, they don't have the ability to show true, proper love to someone else. And they can't care for you. So you have to care for yourself and please understand they will not change. Although they technically have the ability, which just goes to make all of the evil that they commit all the worse. So those of us who have CPTSD, which is complex post-traumatic stress disorder, most of us have it as a result of having been tortured or abused or neglected by narcissists. But the good news for us is that we can heal. And the difference is that trauma survivors who have CPTSD, when they put the work in, they do heal. Would you like to know how to heal your CPTSD? Well, there's five things you need. And those five things are a part of a trauma healing program that I've created. That's helping people to make incredible breakthroughs quickly. We're talking 12 to 16 weeks if they do all of these five things. If they do some of the five things or they kind of take their time or they're implementing pieces here and there, right? They'll still heal. It will just take longer. That's all. You can still heal if you just take parts of my program, but it's just going to take longer. But if you dive uh, head first, fully in, and immerse yourself in the program, and you're doing all five things, you will heal. And it will be relatively quickly. Of course, it's different for every person because our, our trauma is different. The abuse we experience is different. And we're different as individuals. Uh, but you will see definite, amazing results in a reasonable amount of time if you're doing all five things. So what are the five things? Well, first... You have to understand how it is that these five things are healing you. Our mental disorder or psychiatric condition, CPTSD, comes down to the beliefs, the bias, and the behavior 
being maladaptive. It comes down to beliefs, bias, and behavior. So, so you have beliefs, or for those who are already healed here with us today, you had beliefs. You have bias. Bias is a way of thinking. Um, and you have behavior that is maladaptive. That means that they're detrimental to the self. So when a person has beliefs that are untrue or that are detrimental, such as I'm worthless, I'm unlovable, everybody hates me, or I have to get my house perfect, or I want everyone to love me. Uh, these beliefs, these ideas that you that you hold, um, no one can be trusted. These beliefs are untrue, and they're also to your own detriment. You may have beliefs, I can't trust myself. They are untrue, and they're to your own detriment. When you are able to overcome these beliefs, then you'll start to emerge out of CPTSD. But you got to fix the other two things, which is the bias and the behavior. So the bias is the way of thinking, the angle from which you're, you're viewing things. So when people have a negativity bias, for instance, that is a symptom of CPTSD. They tend to look at things always in the negative. Oh, everything bad always happens to me. So with the negativity bias, uh, it affects your attitude and your viewpoint of each situation. And so it's bringing you more depression, more anxiety. You're catastrophizing in your way of thinking. When you catastrophize your way of thinking, you're always expecting the worst. That's a part of negativity bias. And so when your bias is such that if anyone does something to me, that shows to prove that I am worthless. If uh, if if I try to do anything, um, it's always going to work against me. I can't succeed. There's nothing I can do to improve my situation. All of that is negative bias. And so we have to change that bias in order to heal your CPTSD. So now, again, we change the beliefs from detrimental to propitious, which is beneficial to the self. We change the bias from detrimental to beneficial. And now we just have to change the behaviors from detrimental to beneficial. And those who have CPTSD have some behaviors, such as not uh, paying attention to their feelings, not coping correctly. Um, blaming other people, uh, blaming themselves, um, distracting themselves with music, entertainment, television, maladaptive coping mechanisms such as gambling, um, eating too much, uh, utilizing drugs, uh, uh, utilizing sex or relationships. And so all of these are behaviors that are keeping you in the cycle of more abuse and trauma because you're abusing yourself and you're getting more abuse for yourself. And so you're stuck in that cycle of trauma and abuse. And so to break out of that, you need to change the behavior. So you change the beliefs, you change the bias, you change the behavior, and you cure CPTSD. Again, I'm handing it to you. You change the beliefs, you change the bias, you change the behavior, you cure CPTSD and any other mental illness that's associated with it facts. So how do we do it? Well, you need the five things that are a part of my healing program. First thing is you need regular sessions with a specialist. Second thing you need is to be at all the meetings. And then the third thing you need is 30 minutes meditation, 30 minutes edification, 30 minutes exercise. And those are your five things. Let me hit those again. First thing you need, regular sessions with a specialist. I recommend a specialist trained by me, but any specialist you can find who's who can tell you, we've got a program where people are healing and we expect you to heal. Okay, good. Those are the specialists you want to work with. Just because someone has a degree on their wall and you talk to them, if they tell you, we don't think you can heal, we don't think you can get better, find a different specialist. Mm, they're not all created equal. The meetings are designed to help you to connect with others and to stay energetically moving mentally to rewire the circuits of the brain 
So the things you're learning here are helping you to elevate your thinking. And you're able to interact live uh, with me and other survivors. These meetings are essential to the healing process to pull you out of isolation, to pull you in to realize you're not alone. Right now, we have 50 on TikTok, uh, 36 on on um, on our Zoom call, right? So we got like 90 people tuned in right now. So what does that mean? That means that you're not alone. These meetings are beneficial. So be at the live meetings. It's a part of your healing. Then you do 30 minutes a day on average of meditation. This is the exercise for your brain. Your brain's got to exercise. To learn how to meditate in a way that heals you, then you need to tune into uh, my meditation program, which you'll learn in the trauma healing course. You need 30 minutes a day of edification. 30 minutes a day of edification is what you feed the brain, what you read, watch, and listen to. So you need to be reading, watching, and listening to things that are helping you to heal your maladaptations. You can use the trauma healing program, which has videos that you can watch. Enroll in the trauma healing program uh, or... You can watch the YouTube videos for free and get 30 minutes a day of edification. There's almost 200 YouTube videos there. Watch one a day for several weeks. Why? Because we're rewiring the circuits of the brain. We got to change the brain, right? And so edification is what you read, watch, and listen to, to elevate your mind and your thinking. You need 30 minutes a day, minimum edification. And then you need 30 minutes a day on average of exercise, so I'll accept one hour every other day, but you have to exercise regularly because you have to connect to your body. You're a whole organism. You're not just a brain, right? You're a brain and a body and it's all connected. So when we exercise, we fluff up the hippocampus. The hippocampus is a part of the brain that's responsible to having a good memory. And all trauma survivors complain that their memory is not good. Let's get out there and let's work out. Let's do our exercise and let's get everything flowing properly and let's get connected to the body. Let's be stretching. Let's be moving. Let's be running. Let's be building muscle. Let's be losing any excess fat. 30 minutes a day of exercise is a part of our healing process. So those are your five things and they absolutely work. So we have um, Coach Lowe. I would like to bring you into the conversation here, Coach Lowe. Um, what sort of symptoms of CPTSD have you been able to successfully overcome? Well, through the healing course, I realized when I'm feeling depressed is because there's something I really value in this circumstance or situation that I can't fully control. And so I learned to be grateful for what I can, for what I can. I'm, I learned to be grateful for what I can. So like it's concerning the experience, like if I was in a relationship with someone, what can I be grateful for? And I embrace that and I accept what I can't change. And that just took some time. Um, I, I use the job method a lot. You know, what are the stories that I'm telling myself? Meaning what are the thoughts that I'm telling myself about the experience? And then, you know, um, I write that down on the left-hand side and then on the right-hand side, I talk about, well, I, I address it as if I were a parent or a role model, you know, um, and I tell my, I'm basically parenting, reparenting myself as to how I can see this situation. Um, you know, I had a lot of anxiety, um, maladaptive ruminating, and I learned that anxiety is basically there at, to alert me that either I feel in danger or I'm sensing danger. And a lot of times I learned I was creating that danger myself because of the way I grew up and being hyper vigilant. Um, you know, I had parents that were very aggressive with me. And so I walked on eggshells a lot and it took me some time to relax and not to um, feel like I needed to be hyper focused on other person's moods, behavior, facial expressions. You know, um, I was also a people pleaser, um, something that helped me in also with using the healing course and I got therapy with Roman, um, becoming more assertive and radically accepting myself for who I am, the good and the bad, you know, and realizing my needs and wants are equally valued to the needs and wants of others. I learned through the course that people pleasing can be, um, you know, it could be manipulative because the reason why I'm giving so much is because I covertly want something in return secretly, you know, I, I want them to either love me, appreciate me, acknowledge me, 
And so I'm going to overdo and overgive. And when that's not returned, then I'm resentful and I'm bitter. So those are just some of the things that I feel I had low self-esteem also. Um, the job method really helped me with that. You know, when I'm feeling really negative about myself, I like to get to the journal immediately because I can like get in a really bad funk about it. And I write those thoughts down. And then, you know, I notice when I come back on the right hand side as the, you know, wise parent, that stuff doesn't even make any sense. Of course, I'm intelligent. Of course, I've achieved so much. I'm not a loser. You know, I just come back those negative thoughts. And it's helped me be the more I did the job method. Also, honestly, it has helped me be more conscientious, not just not alone of my thoughts, but how I'm speaking to myself. You know, I, I was abusing myself a lot. And so I started paying attention to the conversations that are in my head and it cultivated a new mindset and a new personality. And ultimately, like I'm living a new reality. So I'm so grateful. I appreciate that, Lo. Thanks for for sharing with us. Uh, a lot of people on the call want to know because you're someone who did the things that are required in the in the program. You kept a regular session with your specialist. You came to all the meetings. You watched the videos. You went through the healing course. Um, people want to know: Is this going to work for them? So, do you think other people can heal from their CPTSD doing what you did? Yes. And I mean, like, and honestly, I was a mess. I was such a mess. Like, like I, I don't even recognize the woman that I am today. It, but, but you have to do everything that Roman's saying. Like I had to meditate. Like I work out every day now, back then I wasn't working out. That really helps a lot. Um, my body, like I feel good. I feel healthy. You know, my mind feels healthy. I I've got more control over my mind. Um, I used to have nightmares. I don't have nightmares anymore. I had nightmares about my ex all the time. Like I used to cry. Like I, I did, I was a chronic people pleaser, you know, now I'm more assertive. I know, like, I actually know my needs and wants are equal to others. I'm not going to lose myself to be in relationship with anyone ever again. And I'm building new relationships and I'm seeing the rewards from the work. You know, you have to watch the videos. I would, um, recommend getting with a coach and doing those meetings every single well I saw Roman weekly that was helpful to me I don't know what everyone's scheduled like but for me I sacrificed weekly because I did want to see a change and I was tired and honestly I was afraid like I felt afraid of what my life was going to be because the last relationship I was in was very traumatic and abusive and I did not ever want to experience anything like that and I never wanted to be as um, depressed as I was, like, I just didn't like the place I was in. So I was willing, I like, I hit the pavement and I, I did the work. You guys just have to do the work. If you do the work, you will see a change. I promise you. Thank you so much for that. Well, let's give it up for, for coach Lil. We appreciate her so much. And, and now she's, uh, a trauma recovery specialist who's gone through my program and is trained and certified by me. So, you guys can work with her and, and she can change your life as well. So, so I so admire her and other uh, survivors who have done what was necessary to come through and it's hard work and it takes discipline and sacrifice. And so I really respect you guys and look up to you guys and admire you so much.